Uh, welcome back everyone. Uh, so now we're very lucky to have uh, Kamalika Chaudhuri from uh, UCSD. So Kamalika is an expert in many domains in machine learning, uh, private machine learning, clustering. And uh, today she's going to tell us about nearest neighbor, so more of the classical today and tomorrow more related to adversarial examples. Okay, uh, thanks, uh, thanks very much and thanks to the organizers uh, for inviting me and putting up this great program. So uh, what I'm going to do uh, over today and tomorrow is that I'm going to talk, uh, you know, change tracks a little bit from deep learning and talk a little bit about uh, non-parametrics. And uh, the reason, uh, you know, I feel that non-parametrics are particularly interesting is that, uh, you know, as you have seen throughout this program, there are some nice recent connections, right? So, you know, for example, uh, uh, either Misha or Daniel, you know, I mean, uh, there's some nice connections between uh, regimes where deep learning does interpolation and, you know, behaves sort of like non-parametrics, right? And so this has kind of led to a renewed interest in this area. And what I'm going to do is, uh, today I'm going to talk a little bit about the more classical stuff. So I have uh, on, uh, you know, k-nearest neighbors uh, and then regression and classification. So we are going to talk a little bit about the more classical stuff, what is known, what can be achieved, uh, stuff like this, um, and uh, the some of it, this is based on my own work, and some of it is uh, basically classical work uh, for k nearest neighbors. Tomorrow we are going to change tracks, and we are going to talk about some recent work that we have done on uh, adversarial examples, right? So we are going to talk about adversarial examples for k nearest neighbors. So when uh, you know. Uh, what can we say about adversarial examples there, when is, uh, when is it robust, uh, stuff like that. And then towards the end tomorrow, we are going to go and talk about more general non-parametrics, adversarial examples for more general non-parametrics. And these are some very new results um, that we have uh, on how uh, adversarial examples behave uh, quite a bit differently for non-parametrics than uh, parametrics. Okay, so uh, what is k-nearest neighbors? So this is, you know, one of the simplest uh, kind of uh, pattern recognition methods, right? So uh, from, you know, back in the 50s, right? So uh, what happens is you are given training data, uh, x1, y1 to x and yn, uh, your x lies in some sort of space x, and let's say your labels lie in 0, 1, although it uh, lends itself very nicely when you have uh, a certain uh, more than one labels as well. And basically what you want to do is you want to predict uh, y for, for, you know, you're given a query point x, and you want to predict a y for x based on the k closest neighbors of x among the training data, right? So what you do is you have your x, uh, you look at uh, what are the k closest neighbors of x among the training data, uh, you do some processing, and then you uh, predict, uh, you know, predict the y for x based on just these, uh, you know, just these points, right? And uh, you can do a whole bunch of things. So an example would be k nearest neighbor classification, where what you would be doing is you would predict the majority label of the k closest neighbors, right? Uh, or you can have a weighted majority uh, labels. Uh, there, there's like you know the weights could be based on distances. There's like any number of uh, any number of such example, uh, any number of uh, schemes that you could come up with. And you know, k nearest neighbor regression. You can also talk about you know uh, you predict the average label of your k closest neighbors, right? And uh, notice that uh, what uh, w when I talk about closest. What I am assuming is that there is some underlying metric space, right? So what we assume for k-nearest neighbors is your data points lie in some underlying metric space, and there is some underlying distance function d. So between any pair of points x and x prime, there's a distance. And you know, this distance could be really anything, right? So uh, if you have, uh, so you can think about your instance space as being, you know, r to the d, and uh, r to the capital D, and your d could be the Euclidean distance, or it could be any other LP distance, or it could be some you know, specific distances that is application specific, right? So for example, you could have you know, users giving preferences for uh, objects, and you can have a metric that's based on these user preferences, right? Or you can have, you know, so there's a, there's a whole bunch of things that you could do, and that is what makes this uh, algorithm very powerful because you, know, you can have your favorite metric, and you can have your favorite objects, and you can use this algorithm. 
And uh, here is a notation that I am going to use uh, because it'll make my life simple. And I'm just uh, uh, putting this up, but you will see this quite a bit. So x superscript i of x means the ith nearest neighbor of x, right? So these are, you know, the order, you know, think about them as order statistics, right? Uh, the kind of notation we use for order statistics, uh, x uh, superscript i of x is the ith nearest neighbor of x. And y i of superscript i of x is the label of this ith nearest neighbor, okay? Uh, so this is uh, something we'll be using. Okay, so uh, I am going to, first, and uh, this is what we are going to do today. So today we are going to start with nearest neighbor regression. Uh, we'll talk about what the setting is. We'll talk about some universal consistency results and then some rates of convergence. And then, you know, we'll look at similar things for uh, classification. Okay. So let's start with the regression setting. So let's say we have some compact me metric space, uh, x, uh, x uh, with a distance d, right, with this distance function d. And for now, uh, imagine we have uh, a measure mu on x. And for now, imagine this is the uniform measure. So whatever I'm going to say will work if you are within constant factors of the uniform measure. You know, things will, you know, depend on what this constant is, right? But let's let's just, you know, just to keep things simple for now, imagine we have a uniform measure. Uh, mu on x, okay? And uh, what we have for nearest neighbor regression is we have, our input is a whole bunch of, uh, we have a training, uh, a bunch of training data points, uh, x1, y1 to x and yn, where the xi's are drawn from this uh, measure mu. And our yi's is some function f of xi plus noise, right? And this function f is unknown. Right, so this f, we do not know what this function f is. Uh, it's some underlying function. Uh, your xi comes from mu, yi is f of xi plus noise, right? And here, what we are hoping to do is we are hoping to predict well, okay? And the way we will do this prediction with, uh, um, you know, we are hoping to predict well, so we are given an unknown x, we hope to predict y for this x so that it's close to the actual y, right? And uh, what we will uh, use for this is the k nearest neighbor regressor, which is, so I'm going to call this the f hat k of x, right? So this is, uh, you know, the, uh, the k nearest neighbor regression estimator. This is 1 over k. Uh, I sum of i goes from 1 to k, y i of x, right? So you look at the k closest nearest, uh, k closest neighbors of x, you look at their labels, you average up the labels, that's it. Simplest thing imaginable, okay? So the first question that we are going to ask is, you know, so we have this function. Uh, what kind of function can we approximate well, right, uh, using this kind of uh, k nearest neighbors? And the interesting thing is that we can basically approximate any f. Right? Any f can be approximated well, provided uh, k grows suitably with n. Right? And this is uh, a result, you know, this is just one in a series of results. So there's a whole bunch of results like this for various, you know, over various metric spaces under various conditions. So this is kind of one of the more general results by Debra et al. But essentially, if you have any f, Provided your k is growing suitably with n and certain conditions hold, you can uh, approximate that, them by k nearest neighbor regression. Okay. Uh, and so what do I mean by this? So let's look at more formally, let's look at uh, a theorem. So essentially, uh, the, uh, you need the following conditions. So you need, as your n grows, you need your kn to go to infinity. So if you're doing k nearest neighbors, uh, you need the k, right? kn is, you know, when k grows with n. You need your kn to go to infinity. And you need your kn over n to go to zero, right? If these two conditions hold, then for any f, you would have the following theorem. And the theorem says that expectation of x drawn from mu uh, f of x, right? So remember, you had this underlying function f of x that you didn't know minus f hat of kn of x, the gap between this, the expected gap between these go to zero as n goes to infinity, right? And this is called universal consistency. So what this means is that uh, k nearest neighbor regression is universally consistent, okay? So uh, why, why does this happen, right? Let me give you some intuition for uh, what is going on here. Uh, as n keeps growing, right, as you get more and more points, what happens over here is, remember I talked about how mu was the uniform measure, right? So it's, it's kind of a con uh, continuous mu. Uh, as n grows and grows, what happens is your nearest neighbor, so let's say if you look at your nearest neighbor or if you look at your five nearest neighbors, they will get closer and closer to x, right? 
and if kn is constant right or if it grows slowly right so uh, slowly in the sense that kn over n uh, goes to zero right and this is where this condition is important right kn over n go goes to zero means you are getting more and more local then these k nearest neighbors will also get closer and closer to x right and now if your function f is continuous then f of those k nearest neighbors will also get closer to f of x and if uh, you know this is the this is why you need the continuity right if your f is continuous k nearest neighbors will also get closer and closer to x and then if your kn goes to infinity then if you average right so but uh, don't forget that you know your labels also involve noise but if your kn goes to infinity then if you're averaging the yi's which is f of x i is plus noise that would also go to fx because the effect of, you know you are averaging out noise uh, you know in a, on an average that would go to zero right so uh, as uh, kn goes to infinity then this average also average of the labels also go, goes to f of x right and this is where uh, that kn goes to infinity thing comes into play and you know any f can be approximated arbitrarily well by continuous functions so uh, for any f this sort of thing will hold right sorry this sort of thing would hold and uh, that's uh, that's the universal that that's kind of why uh, we have this kind of universal consistency Okay. okay, so um, we talked uh, about uh, you know how uh, nearest neighbor was universal. Okay, so any any questions so far about universal? Yes, question. Could you, uh, could you explain the intuition to why we need kn by n to go to zero? Excellent question. Yes. So if you have kn by n goes to zero, uh, then what that means is. Uh, kind of the ball that has uh, probability mass kn, that ball kind of gets uh, smaller and smaller, right? So what happens is as kn grows, uh, goes to uh, kn over n goes to zero, you are looking at more and more local regions of space, right? Your kn nearest neighbors are lying, you know, closer and closer to you, and that means that their f's are also closer and closer to your f's, right? Uh, so yes, and could be the case that if we at n point, like uh, increase increase n, like we see like you know like further regions of the space rather than like more concentration close to any point. That, that's an excellent question. So uh, I think what you are saying is uh, so um, right. That is definitely true. Um, here, uh, so you know, for these kinds of problems, the real challenge is when f changes quite a lot. Right. So what you want to say is you want to approximate f locally, right? So those are the kinds of functions you're looking at. You are right that as you get more and more points, like more and more regions of the space will be covered. But what that means is in those regions, you would start getting better and better approximations. Right? Okay, more questions? Yes. Is the noise model arbitrary? Excellent question. So what he's asking is, is the noise model arbitrary? Uh, here, what I am implicitly assuming is that this is zero mean noise, right? And uh, zero mean and also, I guess, you know, any noise that concentrates, right? Uh, any noise where, uh, you know, you get a, some sort of central limit theorem. And exactly, uh, so you wouldn't. So when you try to do rates, then you would end up needing more conditions on the noise. When you try to do rates, but just just for this kind of thing, you just need zero mean and you know some sort of central limit theorem. Okay. Excellent question. Any any more questions? Excellent. I'm, I'm glad you guys are asking questions. Okay. Good. Um, okay. Good. So we talked about universality. Uh, let us now go ahead and uh, look at some rates, okay? So, um, okay, so for convergence rates, uh, so, you know, we talked about, uh, you know, all these asymptotics, when n goes to infinity, what happens, so on and so forth. Uh, but can we say something about finite n, right? Uh, uh, and for that, for regression, um, actually also to some extent for classification, but uh, for that, particularly for regression, what would happen is that we are going to need some more assumptions. And uh, so I'm going to start out with a couple of definitions. So we are going to call a function f, l Lipschitz, if for all pairs x and x prime, 
f of x minus f of x prime, the difference between, you know, the absolute value of this difference is at most L times the distance between x and x prime, right? So what am I saying over here? What I'm saying over here is that uh, if two points are close, their f's are also close, right? Which is, you know, not super surprising, but there is, so the importance of this assumption is that there is a global L that bounds how close the, these are, right? That is kind of the key thing that's going on over here, okay? And uh, what you can say is something like this. So there's a, uh, there's a theorem uh, which shows something like this. And again, um, you know, this has been shown over the years by uh, several people, which is that if your f, if your function f is n Lipschitz, and if you choose your kn in this particular way, uh, and you know, I'll, I'll come to the choice in just a little bit, then there exists a constant c such that the, you know, your expectation of x drawn from mu, uh, f hat k of x minus f of x squared, right, expectation of this gap squared is at most c times n to the minus 2 over 2 plus d, capital D. And recall uh, here capital D is your data dimension, okay? And this is achieved when your k grows in a specific way and the way in which it grows is n to the, you know, some constant uh, and uh, uh, n to the 2 over 2 plus d. And, you know, let me point out that, you know, I know I am hiding a whole bunch of constants over here and those constants actually hide this, um, this uh, L, uh, right? So this, uh, this constant over here depends on L, this constant C over here also depends on L, right? So that's, that's where the dependence on L is heading, okay? Um, and so what does this mean, right? So what does this bound mean? So one thing to notice is that, uh, which is somewhat disappointing, is that there is a dependence on the dimension, right? And so what that means is there is actually a curse of dimensionality, right? What people call the curse of dimensionality, you know, things grow exponentially with the dimension and so on and so forth, right? So it does depend on the dimension, uh, which is somewhat disappointing. However, you can get better bounds for low intrinsic dimension. And you know, there's, there's a lot of people who have worked on this, but uh, you know, uh, I think one of the first such uh, papers was you know, Samori uh, Kapotufe has the very nice paper in uh, NeurIPS uh, 2011, where he gave these kinds of uh, you know, very nice bounds for uh, nearest neighbor regression for uh, lower intrinsic dimension. So if your data lies on some kind of lower dimensional manifold, then uh, that D will become the dimension of the manifold, right? Instead of of the, you know, the intrinsic dimension of the manifold uh, instead of this uh, capital D, right? Okay? Uh, the other thing to notice is that here, your, this particular kn, n to the 2 over 2 plus d, uh, this is actually optimal, right? And, uh, um, and uh, the thing to note is that this is actually pretty high, right? It, it grows with n, but it grows, you know, it's not log n, right? It grows pretty strongly with n, right? Uh, so if your dimension is large, then you know, obviously the dependence goes down, but uh, it, it does grow uh, just sort of polynomially uh, with them. Okay. Yes, question. Aside from this intrinsic dimension, are there natural, uh, other natural assumptions on distribution that would make in this kind of bound meaningful? Bound uh, so for regression, it's a little hard. Uh, for classification, it gets a lot better. So we'll, we'll see that in a little bit. For classification, it's, uh, you know, for classification, you have some good properties, which uh, makes things. Uh, for regression, also, there is smoothness. You can have various, you know, holder continuity, smoothness type assumptions, which make it better. Yes? Uh, does that low intrinsic dimension result assume that you're using sort of a geodesic metric of the manifold you're talking about? Uh, no, 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 no. You are using, you know, regular k nearest But that's what makes it so interesting. Excellent question. Uh, any, any more questions? Okay, good. Okay, so uh, we'll, we'll go over a quick proof of this thing, you know, just, you know, general proof intuitions. Uh, and then we will, uh, so how fast is this convergence? Well, well, we'll look at it in two steps, right? So first we will look at how small are these k nearest neighbor distances, right? And then we will look at, you know, how we go from these distances to these convergence rates, okay? So uh, k nearest neighbor distances, uh, let's, let's define our k of x as the distance to the k nearest neighbor. And the question that we have is how small is this RK of x, okay? So uh, let's say if you look at an x, 
look at a ball of radius, uh, you know, let, let's look at a ball of radius RK of x, right? RK of x is the distance to the kth nearest neighbor. Then if you look at the, uh, you know, what I call the empirical measure of the ball, right? Like the fraction of points in the ball, that's approximately k over n, right? If your k and n is large, uh, that's approximately k over n. And this is close to, and you know, I'm waving my hands a little bit around here, uh, provided your k and n are large enough, this is close to mu of this ball, right? And so if you look at this mu of this ball, and if you assume that the ball is small enough, so you know, again, a lot of hand waving, but <coughs> if you assume this ball is small enough, then mu of this ball is a very approximately, you, you know, look at the ball, uh, let's say everything is more or less the same, the mu of x in that entire ball is more or less the same. This is approximately mu of x, and there should be some constant, times the kth nearest neighbor radius to the power of d, right? And you know, um, you know, again, this is like a very, very uh, back of the envelope calculation. But what this means, right? So what this means over here is that your RK of x, right, distance to your kth nearest neighbor, looks something like this, right? So it's one over mu of x times k over n raised to the power of one over d, where d is the data dimension, right? And this is bad news, right? Because now you have the curse of dimensionality. Right, this is pretty bad news. Okay. Oh, k over n is the is mu of b x. Uh, Approximately. Right, you know, there are epsilons and deltas, but I'm just kind of waving my hands over there. Okay. Okay. So this is bad news because we have the curse of dimensionality. But you can show that this is, you know, again, better for data with low intrinsic dimension. And there's, there's been some work on this, you know, uh, the Costa and uh, Al Hero and uh, Richard Samworth, you know, people have looked at this and you can get uh, better for data of low intrinsic dimension. Okay. okay, so now we know how bad the nearest neighbor distances are. Uh, now let us look at how to get to, um, how, how to use this, okay? So, uh, remember that initially what we were trying to do is we were trying to get rates of convergence for k nearest neighbor regression. Uh, and uh, now what we'll do is we will get there, right? Uh, so the first thing is, you know, we are doing k nearest neighbor regression. What we are going to do is we are going to break this up into a bias variance decomposition, right? So notice, uh, so we are going to define this f tilde uh, k of x, right? And f tilde k of x is, you know, notice you had the labels, right? So what you were doing is you were taking the average over the labels or uh, the average over the y's, right? And so what you're going to do is you're going to assume that this average is the expected, uh, you know, what you get is the expectation, right? So, uh, and the difference between your f and if you got the expected values of the y's, right, uh, that gap squared, that is your bias, right? So we are going to bound this. Plus, uh, the gap between what you really get with the real labels minus the expected value of the labels, that is the variance, and we are going to bound this gap, right? And what you can show through some math is that uh, you can get, uh, you know, you can look at the entire, uh, you know, gap between fkx and f of x squared, you can decompose it into these two parts. Okay, so you know it's a standard bias variance decomposition. Okay, uh, and now what we will do is we will bound each of them one by one, right? So uh, first, let's uh, start out by bounding the bias. You bound the bias. So this is I am just writing down what the bias is, right? Because uh, now notice that the y, you know, this is the expected value of the y's, right? So the uh, the noise in the y's is gone. The noise part is gone. And by your Lipschitzness, this is at most uh, L times this distance. So each of these is at most L times the distance between x and the kth nearest neighbor of x squared, right? And I am, you know, like I'm glossing over various constants, but this is what, what it is. And, you know, each of these, and so you're, you know, averaging, so this is, uh, you know, it's at most the, uh, the average. And notice that, you know, we talked about what the RK distances were, and they were, you know, about k over n times 1 over d. Uh, and so this is, uh, you know, there's a square here, so it becomes a 2 over d. Okay? Okay, what about the variance? So variance, you can also, you know, you can again write this down. And uh, here is, you know, your question about the, what, what can you say about the noise? Here, 
you have to sort of have bounded variance noise. So that, that thing comes in. And uh, the variance again, you look at the, so the variance again becomes essentially the variance of the noise, and uh, which is sigma y squared over k. Okay, and you can also think about noise of you know non-uniform variance in different part of space, but it doesn't matter. So long as the uh, worst case noise variance is bounded, you get this kind of thing. Okay, you can even do probably you can even do better. Okay, okay. So that was the bias variance decomposition. So you put everything together and you just sort of ignore the constants, which I'm doing just for the sake of the talk. What you get is when you do this bias variance decomposition, you would get uh, an expression like this, right? So your variance is about one over k, uh, you know, the sigmas and stuff, let's ignore them for the moment, and your bias is k over n to the two over, uh, two over d, okay? And now uh, what you have is, so, uh, so now, you know, I mean, this is good, uh, but what you have is you have the power to set k, right? So if you want to optimize this bias variance decomposition, you can set your k to be n to the 2 over 2 plus d. If you just do some you know, algebra, you can see that this is the optimal, and uh, that will give you this rate. right? So you get a rate of n to the negative 2 over 2 plus d. Okay? So this is kind of the main idea of the proof. Okay. Questions so far? Could you go back to the slide where you defined R KMX? Yes. Defined, right? Yeah, yes. Uh, so, okay, yeah. yeah, so there was a 1 over mu x. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, okay, good, good point. That is a very good point, I think, that you have raised. So, uh, here, we are implicitly assuming that mu of x is a constant, right? It lies between mu min and mu max. And remember, at the very beginning, I said that let's assume that we are in the uniform distribution, right? Uh, that's that's where it comes from. Okay, if you are not in the uniform distribution, there's actually a very nice paper by uh, Richard Samward which looks into this. The analysis gets much more complicated, and you can you know still say something, but you know things are just a lot more complicated. Excellent point. Yes. Okay. Excellent questions. Okay. So that is uh, more or less it for uh, nearest neighbor regression. Okay. So let's now look at nearest neighbor classification. So you know, uh, for classification, uh, we are going to you know again you know it's the same problem. You look at your the uh, you know we are going to use H and K to denote the K nearest neighbor classifier on endpoints. We are going to look at uh, you know the so when you give an X, you're going to look at the labels of the K points around X, and then you're going to uh, predict the basically you predict the majority of the labels. Right, so you average the labels, average less than half, you know, labels are zero, one, average is less than half, you predict uh, zero, more than half, predict one, so on and so forth. Okay, good. Uh, so now, what are we going to do? Well, we are going to look at these things in the uh, statistical learning framework, right? So what is the framework in which we are going to analyze things? So here is our setting. Now the setting changes a little. Uh, we have a, the, you know, this is a statistical learning framework. Again, we have some metric space, x and d, okay? Uh, and now we have, again, we have an underlying measure mu on x from which points are drawn. But the important distinction is that now we are not going, so classification has some nice properties and it's easier than regression. And now we are not going to need to assume that this measure is, you know, either uniform or close to uniform, right? We, we won't need that assumption anymore. And uh, you know, so for the regression case, we talked about you know f of x and you know f of x plus noise. Now we are talking about zero one, right? So now we have uh, you know the label of a point is binary, and what we are going to assume is that it's a coin flip with bias eta of x, right? So eta of x is the probability that uh, your y will be one conditioned on x. Okay, so this is eta of x, and um, so 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 that's your setting. And what do we care about is we want to find, you know, the things that we care about in a classifier is the risk, right, or risk or error, which is the probability that h of x is not equal to y, right, when x and y are drawn from the distribution. x is drawn from mu and y condition on x is drawn from eta. Uh, the risk is uh, probability h of x is not equal to y. And then we have accuracy, which is 1 minus the risk, 
right? And, uh, and basically what we want to do is we want to find an age that maximizes risk, uh, that, sorry, that minimizes risk or maximizes accuracy, right? So that's, that's kind of what we are hoping to do, okay? And you know, so this is kind of important a little bit for tomorrow because tomorrow when we look at robust classifiers, that's not exactly the right thing. And you know, we'll, we'll uh, just remember this slide for tomorrow. Okay, good. Okay, so um, before I get to uh, you know near uh, you know nearest neighbors, let me introduce one other thing which you know you must have seen before, which is the Bayes optimal classifier. So what is the Bayes optimal classifier? Well, it's the classifier that's going to predict zero if eta of x is less than or equal to a half, and it's going to predict one otherwise, right? And uh, so what is the risk of this classifier? Well, you know, you can, you know, sit together and do the calculation. Essentially, the risk, uh, you know, comes out to be something like this, right? Expectation over x, min of eta of x, 1 minus eta of x, right? And we are going to call this quantity r square, uh, r star, sorry, r star, right? And why is this classifier interesting? Well, the reason why this classifier is interesting, because this is the classifier that minimizes risk. If you have this kind of distribution, mu and, uh, uh, mu and eta, no other classifier in the world is going to do better than this, right? This is the one that absolutely minimizes risk, okay? Why don't we always have the Bayes optimal? Well, the thing to note is that to have the Bayes optimal, you need to know what eta is, right? The reason why we don't have the Bayes optimal is that, you know, it's a eta is a distribution quantity and you don't know what it is, right? So uh, that's why we don't have it, but we want it. Okay, good. Okay, so now that we have our framework, it's, uh, it's all set up for us. Now let's look at what is possible, okay? So the first question that we have is again, you know, the, uh, you know, again, so, so remember in regression, what we were doing is we were trying to get to F, right? That underlying F that was there. Here, what we are trying to get to is the Bayes optimal. That is the goal, you know, that is the elusive goal that we want, right? And the first question that we are going to ask is does uh, R of H, the risk of H and K, H and K is the K nearest neighbor classifiers with N training points and, you know, K, converge to R star as N grows, okay? So, uh, and, and, you know, when does it happen? Does it happen at all, okay? So let's start out with trying to understand what happens for one nearest neighbor. So here I'm going to assume, you know, just to make my life simpler, I'm going to assume continuous error. I'm also going to assume absolutely continuous mu. Okay. And in that case, uh, there is a result by um, Cover and Hart from 1967, which shows that, you know, this is, this is not the case at all. And in fact, what you can show is that the risk of the one nearest neighbor classifier converges to something which looks like this. Uh, this is the expectation over x <coughs> twice et eta of x times 1 minus eta of x and this is this is not r star right so this is not the Bayes optimal risk right so what we know over here is that one nearest neighbor is inconsistent and actually k nearest neighbor if your k is constant then your k nearest neighbor will also be uh, you know inconsistent in the sense that it doesn't converge to the Bayes optimal right so one nearest neighbor does not converge to the Bayes optimal Constant k also doesn't quite converge to the Bayes optimal, although its limit is a little bit better. So this, this particular limit gets better as k grows, but it doesn't converge to the Bayes optimal. Okay, so what, what happens over here? Uh, let's try to, you know, let, let me try to give you a little bit of intuition, right? So again, you know, as uh, n is larger, grows larger and larger, you know, the nearest neighbor of x is going to come closer and closer to x, right? So the nearest, nearest neighbor will slowly converge to x. And uh, since we assume continuity, what that means is that the eta at that nearest neighbor is also going to converge to the eta at x, okay? And uh, so now, if you uh, look at what is happening to the label uh, of, you know, what is happening to the label of uh, x and the label of the nearest neighbor, you can look at what, uh, you know, what is the probability that they are different. Well, uh, that probability is eta of x times 1 minus eta at the nearest neighbor of x plus eta at the nearest neighbor of x. So this is like, you know, when eta is 0, uh, sorry, when eta is 1, uh, the label, uh, the label, uh, sorry, when the label of x is 1, the label of nearest neighbor is 0, La near label of nearest neighbor is 1, label at x is 0, right? That's when they disagree. And since this 
quantity converges to eta of x, you can show that the whole thing converges to twice eta x times 1 minus eta x, right? And so the risk does not really converge to the base optimal, it converges to this particular thing. And then for k nearest neighbors, you know, you can, you know, for constant k, you can again do a calculation like this and you can show something which depends on k, but again, it's not, not exactly R star. Okay, uh, so fine, so constant k is not good. Uh, what can you say about growing k? So about growing k, uh, one can again show a similar result uh, than on, uh, that we can uh, show under regression. What we can show is that if eta is continuous, then if kn goes to infinity and if kn over n goes to zero, then the risk of the k nearest neighbor, kn nearest neighbor classifier converges to the risk of the Bayes optimal as n goes to infinity. And this is, you know, this was done in a long sequence of results. So there was a paper by, uh, you know, Fix and Hodges in uh, 1951. Stone looked at it for, you know, R to the D. Cover and Hart has a series of results. So this was established for a whole bunch of metric spaces uh, over time. Okay. And, uh, you know, again, I uh, can give you a little bit of intuition. Uh, essentially, the intuition is as follows. Uh, you know, it's, it's very similar. So as, you know, uh, kn grows, uh, as, as, you know, as n grows, what happens is your x1 to x kn of x lie approximately in a ball of probability mass kn over n, right? And if kn over n is zero, then, uh, you know, then this radius of this ball grows smaller and smaller. And what this means is that these nearest neighbor converge to x, right? And by continuity, the eta at these nearest neighbors, uh, you know, also converge to eta of x. And, uh, and so if your kn grows, then, uh, you know, uh, now, you know, kind of the law of large number kicks in. So if your kn grows, uh, then, you know, you are tossing n coins, each of whose bias is very close to eta of x, then the average also converges to basically eta of x and, and you're good, okay? So that's kind of the proof intuition. It's uh, quite similar to regression. Okay, uh, you can also do something which is a little bit better and uh, which, is a, uh, which is also a little bit better. Um, essentially, you can show something much more general. Uh, so you can ask questions like, you know, when does this condition hold? And you can show something fairly general. So if you have a metric measure, a separable metric measure space, where, uh, you know, there's this property called the Lebesgue differentiation property holds, then you can show this kind of universal consistency. And what is the Lebesgue differentiation property? This property says that for any bound and measurable f, if you look at the average of f in a ball uh, and the radius of this ball goes to zero, uh, then this average converges to f of x, right? Uh, as the radius of this ball goes to zero, then you can, uh, you know, then you can show universal consistency. Right, and you know, and uh, this is some uh, joint work with Shanja Dasgupta from a paper in 2014, where you know, so this has some other uh, connotations. If k n goes to infinity and k n over n goes to zero, then we can show convergence in probability. For almost sure convergence, we need a little bit more, uh, and we need k n over log n uh, to go to zero. Then we can also show uh, uh, Sorry, we can also show you uh, almost sure convergence. Okay. And uh, this is again, you know, the proof is again, the idea is uh, uh, intuition is very similar, um, but the difference is the following. So earlier when we were looking at continuity, what we said was that, you know, the eta at these nearest neighbors has to go to eta of x, right? Now what we just need is that their average has to go to eta of x, right? And, you know, which is a loser condition. Um, and, uh, and then, um, uh, essentially, uh, that, that's essentially what this, uh, uh, what this Lebesgue differentiation property shows. So I don't want to go into too much detail because uh, I'm sort of running out of time, but that's, that's essentially this average uh, differentiation property shows, right? So this average property requires that, you know, uh, eta of, this average eta would converge to eta of x. Okay, and uh, as uh, the radius goes to zero, and you know, as the radius, uh, and this radius will go to zero if k n over n goes to zero. Okay, so that's kind of the main idea. Okay, uh, questions? Yes? Um, what do we know about the finite sample case? Yes, that's the next one. Thank you. I planted him in the audience. <laughs> okay, good. So now let us look at the finite sample case. 
So what did we do before? So, you know, before we talked about, oh, if mu was smooth, then, you know, stuff like that. So, you know, uh, okay, so there's been a, a fair bit of prior work on this. Uh, and, you know, I'm not going to go into it because a lot of it is similar in uh, spirit to the regression results that I showed before, right? Um, and the main idea was that, you know, you assume some sort of smoothness of mu, and then they will say, oh, if mu, mu is small, you can get small, uh, this uh, k nearest neighbor radius. And then you can talk about Lipschitzness of eta, and, you know, oh, if eta is Lipschitz, then, the, you know, eta at the kth, uh, kth neighbor is close to eta of x, and now we can bound everything, right? So which is what we did for regression. That's what we used to bound everything, right? For classification, the observation that we made, so this is, uh, you know, joint work with Shanjay Dasgupta. The observation that we made was that neither of these things actually matter. So let me show you uh, a picture, okay? So in fact, let me show you two pictures. What matters, okay? So uh, l let's look at this, right? So here, your mu is not really smooth, right? This mu, you know, it's like uh, the density is really a mess, right? You know, at some places it's zero, at some places it's very high, some places it's very low. It doesn't really matter because k nearest neighbor is going to work pretty well over here, unless you are, you know, very close to over here, right? It's going to work pretty well, okay? And here as well, right? If you look at this, again, the density is, you know, uh, here, uh, close to the decision boundary, the density is really well and good. But over here, you know, it's, it's just all over the place, right? It, it doesn't really, but, you know, again, if you look at nearest neighbors, it doesn't really matter, right? So what really matters, what is, uh, you know, what really matters in nearest neighbor classification? What really matters is what happens in balls of not a radius r, but in balls of probability mass approximately k over n around x, where x lies close to the decision boundary, right? So what goes on in balls of probability mass k over n around here and maybe a little bit around here, right? That's all that matters, right? Far from the decision boundary, your mu could be anything. It could be like, you know, horrible. No, nobody cares, right? And that is kind of the underlying basis of the analysis, okay? And that really, you know, that, uh, as, as you will see, that really cleans things up quite a bit. Uh, things become really quite clean, okay? Okay, so now uh, that's kind of our intuition. And let's try to formalize this, okay? So what we will do is we will look at the notion of, so we were looking at k, uh, you know, distance to the kth nearest neighbors, you know, this is a, uh, a distance to kth nearest neighbors, right? Distance to the nearest neighbors, and we were looking at actual distance radius. Now, what we will do is we'll start looking at something we call the probability radius, right? So R, so here P is a number between zero and one, P is a probability, and the probability radius uh, at uh, P uh, around x is the following quantity. It's the infimum of the radius such that the probability mass at this radius is at least p, right? And you know, I mean, just think about this as being equal to p, right? The probability mass at this radius is equal to p. I'm going to all this infimum just to make sure things work out okay and, uh, you know, open balls and close balls and stuff like that. But uh, just for now, imagine that, you know, this is the radius at which the probability mass around x uh, the ball of probability mass uh, or at this radius around x has like p probability mass, right? And we will also talk about conditional probabilities for sets, right? So the conditional probability of a set of points is essentially the average uh, eta over that set, right? And the average, you know, so what is it that we take the average over? Well, we take the average over this mu, right? If there was this underlying distribution mu over x, that's what we take the average over, okay? And this is, you know, a picture of this thing. Okay, so now with these definitions in place, what we can do is we can start talking about, so remember I, you know, I just kind of showed you these pictures and taught, uh, said how things away from the boundary doesn't matter, right? Now what we will do is we will formalize these notions, okay? So we can start looking at, you know, notions of interiors and boundaries, okay? So the positive, so we will look at two, uh, you know, uh, th there will be two parts, the positives and the negatives. So the positive interior is the following, uh, is the set of all points x, where eta x is greater than or equal to a half, right? So this is, you know, so if you took the uh, majority, uh, you know, so if you took the right label, the right label is plus, right, uh, over here, eta x is greater than or equal to a half. Eta over a ball of radius, uh, R around X 
is greater than equal to half plus delta for all r less than equal to r p of x, right? So this is uh, this positive interior is parameterized by two parameters, p and delta, right? So p is a probability, uh, and delta is you know think about it as another kind of uh, you know so think about it as this gap, right? So how far are you from the decision boundary? So if your eta x is equal to a half, that's your decision boundary of the Bayes optimal, right? So think about delta as how far are you from the decision boundary, right? So eta of x is greater than or equal to a half, so the right label is plus uh, or one, right? And for all r less than or equal to rp of x, right? Uh, this ball of, uh, so anything within this, uh, any ball within this probability mass p, the average eta in any of these balls is at least half plus delta. Okay, and this is the positive interior. Similarly, you can also define the negative interior. What will happen is this will become less than or equal to half, this will become less than or equal to half minus delta, right? So that this one is the positive part, that one is the negative part, right? And then anything, uh, and then the p delta interior is kind of the union of these positive and negative interiors. And anything that's not in there, that's the p delta boundary, right? So uh, anything that is left outside, so you look at your entire instance space, anything that is left outside, that is the p delta boundary, okay? Okay. So now we can write down the risk of the k-nearest neighbor classifier uh, based on n training points uh, as a function of these interiors and boundaries, right? And what we can do is we can say uh, that with probability at least one minus delta, little delta, right? So that's actually missing from this statement. But with probability at least uh, one minus little delta, this risk is at most r star, remember r star was the, uh, the risk of the Bayes optimal classifier, plus little delta, plus the probability mass of this, of this uh, p delta boundary, right? p uh, capital delta boundary, provided your p and delta are set, up, set appropriately, okay? How are you going to set p? p would be uh, k over n times this particular quantity, right? So this is, uh, you know, when your k is just sort of large enough with respect to, so if your k is bigger than log two over delta, then this is kind of a constant, right? So it's a constant time k over n, and k has to be, you know, larger than log two over delta to get high probability bounds. So then that would be, uh, you know, so that, that, that would be, so this is a constant provided k is at least log uh, one over delta. Think about it that way, okay? So this is your p, okay? And your capital delta, is something like this, it's a minimum of half and square root log uh, two over delta over k. So, you know, this could be a constant. So if your k grows as log one over delta, then this is like a constant. But if your k grows a little bit faster, then this also goes to zero, right? So if k grows faster, then your delta will also go to zero, okay? And your p is k over n, notice, and you know, since you, you know, if you want consistency, then you can get, uh, let your k over n go to zero. Okay, questions? Okay, so um, let me again give you a little bit of intuition for this proof, uh, you know, for, for what is going on around here. Uh, notice that if your h and k of x is not equal to h of x, right? So if your uh, classifier is not agreeing with your Bayes optimal, then why, why isn't it agreeing with the Bayes optimal? Well, you know, it could not agree because of several reasons. So let's see what could happen. One thing that could happen is that x lies in that p delta boundary, right? If x lies in the p delta boundary, we're just gonna give up on it, right? And you know, which is fine, you know, that, that's why that mu p delta shows up in the bound, right? So we're just gonna give up on it, okay? The other thing that could happen is that, let's say x doesn't lie in the p delta boundary, right? So it does lie in the p delta interior. And, however, the, you know, however, your training data is such that the distance to its kth nearest neighbor is strictly greater than rp of x, right? And, you know, which could happen by chance. So normally, uh, if you look at p, p is k over n times a constant, right? So normally, if, you know, things all went well with high probability, this sort of thing wouldn't happen, but it could happen by chance. Right, that this is greater than uh, RP of X. So that's something that could have happened. So that is why you are not agreeing. You get a lot of these points which are, you know, not the right thing. 
The other thing that could happen is that these labels could be, you know, really kind of noisy. And what could happen is um, that uh, this quantity, uh, you know, this this uh, this this particular uh, thing could happen, right? So what this means is that if you look at the ball uh, of, uh, you know, if you look at that uh, ball of uh, probability mass p, and if you average, you know, the y uh, y i's times the x i's in the ball minus the eta, so this this average should be, you know, close to eta. But if this average is more than delta away from eta, then you know maybe your uh, you know maybe your points are fine. The points all lie within this uh, you know within the right ball. But what happened was that you know just somehow the average was uh, off, right? So that is the other thing that could happen. Okay. So um, why why is that? Because so let's say the one doesn't hold, right? So if the first thing doesn't hold, that which means that x lies in the interior, then your eta x is bound. To, and and let's say for now, so you know eta x is either uh, you know either your x is on the positive side or the negative side. So for now, let's just say x is on the positive side. In that case, your eta of b is at least half plus uh, capital delta, right? So this is the condition. Uh, this is how we defined our k, our p delta interior. So that that's how we define things, right? And then uh, what that means is. Either the kth nearest neighbor of x lies outside b, which is condition two, or the averages, uh, you know, don't average, uh, or the labels don't average up properly, which is condition three. Right. So this is, you know, this is, uh, you know, what we just explained. Okay. So now what we need to do is we need to figure out uh, how often do these things happen. Okay. What you can show is that if you set p in this particular way, you can use a simple Chernoff bound to show that the probability of the second event happening is at most delta over 2, right? And that's, in fact, exactly how we set up p. This is why p is set up to be this way, right? So the probability of this event is at most delta over 2, very simple churn of mount, OK? And uh, for number 3, again, if you set delta to be this particular quantity, then the probability that number 3 happens is also at most delta over 2. And again, this is channel bounds, right? It's you know, very simple channel bounds. And, uh, uh, and uh, so this probability is also delta over 2, right? And now, if you put everything together, essentially, your risk becomes uh, probability that the, uh, the base optimal doesn't give you the right label plus the probability of the first event, which is x lies in this, uh, x lies in this uh, boundary, p delta boundary, plus the probability of the second event and the probability of the third event, right? And you know, the first one is r star. The second one is just the mu, the, the measure of this boundary. The third one, and you know, these and these, we set up our p's and deltas so that this probability summed up to delta, right? And just you know, putting these all together, you know, we get this theorem. And you know, if you look at the paper, this theorem is just a one-page proof. It's just you know, it's very simple. It's just a one-page proof. The uh, the the kind of the the real you know technical thing is setting up the definitions properly. That's that's a real contribution. Okay. okay. So um, okay. So now, what else can we say about this? Uh, so previous in, in previous work, um, people had looked at nearest neighbors under various kinds of, uh, and this is you know again similar to regression and similar to the question that Vitaly asked earlier. People had looked at nearest neighbors at uh, under various kinds of assumptions. So uh, a couple of t you know a few typical assumptions are something like this. So one is holder continuity, and you know not just nearest neighbors, like a lot of non-parametric methods are also studied under this assumption. So one is holder continuity. And uh, this eta is said to be alpha holder continuous if for uh, some constant L and all x and x prime, the gap between eta of x and eta of x prime is at most L times uh, the distance between x and x prime raised to the alpha, right? So this is alpha holder continuity. And then there are these Sibakov, uh, Memon Sibakov uh, margin conditions, which say that essentially, uh, so again, you know, this is, uh, by the way, this is uh, very similar to the Lipschitz thing we talked about. And here again, the key to uh, this is that there is one L, right? One L globally. That is the key to this thing. Okay, so uh, that is kind of the important bit over here, right? And uh, <laughs> so this is, you know, similar to Lipschitz, only that it is raised to the power of alpha. Okay. 
Then the second thing that people have looked at is what are called margin conditions, right? So this is the Mamosibok of uh, margin conditions. For any constant C and for any T, the measure of excess such that eta x minus half is less than or equal to t is at most c times t to the beta, right? And here beta is a parameter. So what does this mean? What this means is that if you look at, um, so basically what this means is that there isn't a lot of excess for which eta x is too close to a half, right? That's essentially what it means. So if you look at excess where eta lies, uh, you know, within half plus minus t, the measure of those x's is not that much, right? So there aren't that many points close to the decision boundary. So in, in that sense, it's a margin condition, right? And um, there is also something called the odibert sibakov condition, so which is essentially the two above two conditions plus a condition that mu is supported on a regular set with uh, mu min less than equal to mu less than equal to mu max. So you know within constant uh, factors of the uniform distribution. Uh, under these conditions, you can show that uh, expectation of the risk minus R star, if you set K properly, then this is uh, N to the minus alpha times beta plus one over two alpha plus, uh, sorry, uh, this should be capital D, where D is the dimensionality of the data, right? And this can be achieved and this is also optimal. So this was, uh, this, this, this is known. And this can also be achieved by K nearest neighbors for suitable K, okay? But now, uh, based on you know, kind of this uh, way of looking at things, what we can do is we can talk about a different notion of smoothness, right? And which will make things cleaner, which is, uh, and which you know, we think is a more natural notion, which is uh, instead of relating smoothness to, uh, you know, instead of putting down all these conditions, what we can think about is you relate smoothness not to the distance between x and x prime, but to the probability mass of a ball of radius uh, you know, equal to the distance between x and x prime, right? You look at the distance between x and x prime, you look at x and a ball of radius uh, around that, right? If that ball is like a high density ball, then, you know, then you have, then you have to stay, you know. So that's, that's kind of the, uh, that's kind of the main idea, right? And you can define this, uh, and we define this notion um, on eta. So we say eta is alpha smooth if for some constant L and for all x and r greater than zero, uh, the gap between eta at x and the average eta over the ball of radius uh, of uh, a ball of radius r around x is at most L times the probability mass of the ball of radius uh, r around x raised to the alpha, right? So now instead of distances, we have probability masses, right? So what this means is that even if your r is small, but you are in a high density region of space, uh, your eta can change pretty rapidly, right? Whereas if you're in a low density region of space, uh, then eta has to change slowly, right? And this is kind of, this is the sort of thing that makes sense for nearest neighbors, right? Because when you are in a high density region of space, your k nearest neighbors are very, very close. So things can change, can change rapidly. And if things do change rapidly, you will get some results. Whereas if you're in a low density region of space, your, you know, your nearest neighbors are pretty far. And, you know, so then your eta cannot change that rapidly because then you can't do so well, okay? And you can, under these smoothness conditions, you can also get, uh, you know, we can get uh, various upper and lower bounds. So for example, we can show that if your uh, eta is um, alpha smooth, uh, according to the definition that we just talked about, then for, excuse me, uh, yeah. So if your eta is alpha smooth, according to the definition that we just talked about, then for any n and k with probability uh, at least one minus delta, you can get a bound like this, right? So this shows the risk of your um, k nearest neighbor classifier. That is at most delta plus the measure of uh, the following set. So what is the set? If you look closely at the set, the set is, uh, basically what happens, uh, the set of all x's whose eta is within half plus minus square root one over k log one over delta, right? So if you look at the decision boundary and if you look at all x's which are, uh, whose eta is half plus minus, you know, let's say half plus minus one over square root k, those x's, uh, you know, you have to give up on, right? Those x's you're not gonna do so well on but the rest you're going to get, and for the rest you just have, you just pay a delta, which is kind of the, 
which just comes from basically large deviations. And, uh, and, and these x's you have to give up, right? So this is essentially what your interior would look like, right? So remember we talked, uh, sorry, this is essentially what your uh, p delta boundary would look like, right? So this is, remember we talked about the interiors and boundaries. And uh, this you can get for, I think, k basically proportional to n to the 2 alpha over 2 alpha plus 1, OK? And then lower bounds, uh, you could also show some lower bounds. And basically your lower bounds say, that uh, you have to give up on uh, these, right? And um, so this part is sort of gone, but you have to give up on, with constant probability, you have to give up on all those x's whose eta is uh, half plus minus uh, one over square root k. So if you think about uh, you know, those x's, uh, in the margin, whose eta is like half plus minus one over square root k, well, you know, with k nearest neighbors, you you won't be able to uh, get them accurately, right? So you, you won't be able to really get, you know, you have to give up on them, you won't be able to get them accurately, right? And, and you know, which, which sort of makes sense, okay? And, you know, again, notice that these are, you know, very distribution dependent bounds, right? So you can have distributions where this is huge, so you're giving up on quite a lot of points, or you can have distributions where this is, uh, you know, quite slim, and then uh, you're doing pretty well, okay? Uh, so, you know, so I showed you something on smoothness. I won't go into too much detail because, you know, now we are close to lunch. Uh, you can also use this kind of analysis to get faster rates for special cases, right? So, for example, uh, one interesting case is what happens when you have zero base risk, right? So your eta is exactly zero or one. Yes? Uh, the classes in the previous slide depend on the dimension. Constants in the previous slide. No, no. This, you know, uh, this, these two certainly don't. This one may. I'll have to look this up. This one may, but these two certainly don't. They don't depend on the Actually, you know, this this one doesn't either. Okay, so one interesting case is, you know, I mean, we also look at several other interesting cases in our, uh, in our paper. Uh, so one interesting case is what happens when you have zero base risk, right? Uh, where eta is just zero or one, and you know, this happens uh, a lot of times. And there, uh, so, you know, remember we had started by talking about how, you know, one nearest neighbor doesn't work, right? One nearest neighbor is just inconsistent, right? But in those, in that particular case, uh, now that we are doing a finer analysis, what we can show is one nearest neighbor has the best rates, right? Uh, and uh, better than any other k, uh, or at least I mean that's the upper bound, right? So we can show a better upper bound for one nearest neighbor than for any other k nearest neighbor. And if you think about it carefully, that actually makes sense. Because in k near, so when you have zero base risk, your pluses or minuses are really just kind of separated. Uh, unless they're too, too close, you know, they're, they're just kind of separated. And what would happen is uh, if you do k nearest neighbors, then you have to look at, you know, k points around you. Whereas if you are, uh, and, and everybody has the same eta, right? So your neighbors all have the same eta. Uh, so you would expect one nearest neighbor to do well because you just want to find one point from the same class. Um, if you don't have uh, zero base risk, then you need more to average things over. But if you do have zero base risk, this is, uh, you know, intuitively that's what you would expect to happen. And we can, you know, we can show in terms of upper bounds, we can at least, uh, you know, get a better upper bound for one nearest neighbor than for the others, right? The other interesting case is, you know, we were, uh, all, all this while we were talking about, you know, half plus minus delta, but delta could get pretty close to zero, right? But what happens if delta is bounded away from zero? In that case, we can also get exponential convergence when, when n is large enough, right? So when we are at the point where delta is, uh, you know, when n is large enough, where the radius is at the point when delta is bounded enough away from zero, we can actually get uh, really good convergence. And, you know, just the fact that this is a finer analysis, these things just sort of show up. Show up and, you know, and they show up very nicely and cleanly. Okay. Okay, so uh, in conclusion, um, we looked at basically k nearest neighbor regression and classification. 
uh, we talked about uh, what, what happens there, right? So we started out with some classical stuff. We showed that K nearest neighbor is uh, universally consistent, provided K grows in a certain way with N, right? So this K over N goes to zero and K goes to infinity. So this stuff is important. Then we showed that, uh, you know, in K nearest neighbor, unfortunately, we do suffer from the curse of dimensionality, right? The price of this much flexibility is the curse of dimensionality. And uh, in fact, K nearest neighbor regression, you really get to see this. For classification, you, you also get to see it. I mean, there is definitely a curse of dimensionality. But the thing is that you can do better if you are, uh, you know, if you're, uh, if, if you have good properties around the decision boundary, right? So if your decision boundary stuff around it is well behaved, then in uh, K nearest neighbor classification, uh, you do get to do better, right? And which is, uh, you know, which is better than regression. For regression, the for regression, the challenge is that you have to do well all over the space, right? Whereas for classification, the you know, this kind of this observation in our work is that. Um, you know, you really only care about what happens around the decision boundary, and if there things are well behaved enough, that can, you know, that can get you get you through. Okay, and uh, and finally, I would like to thank uh, you know my co-author Shanjay Das Gupta, and uh, a lot of this work was a lot of the classification stuff was based on joint work with him, and also part of this talk is based on a tutorial that uh, Shanjay and Samori Kaputufe uh, gave uh, last year, and I'd I'd like to thank them for their help. Thank you. Okay. Any further questions? Yes. Uh, can you go back to that slide with the upper lower bounds for classification? Yes. Uh, yeah. This one, right? Yeah. So, so you were talking about how the classification case still has the curse of dimensionality. That doesn't come up, at least as I can see right now. Uh, yes. So, uh, yeah. So the margin, if not, you know, if you look at the uniform distribution, yeah. then it would come up. Okay. You're absolutely right. So it, it doesn't because the margin is so low. Yes. So uh, under the same assumptions, what about epsilon nearest neighbors? Do they get the same rate? or is what, what, what are epsilon nearest neighbors? Um, when you fix the bandwidth, basically. You, you fix the, that? You use a fixed bandwidth instead of k nearest neighbors? Ah, ah the kernel classifiers, yeah. you mean, right. Uh, you know, I don't exactly know. Uh, is the spatial, I mean, is the KNNs by spatial adaptivity in some sense that epsilon and so on? So for kernel classifiers, uh, the problem would be that you would still depend on the rest of the space. Right? So for nearest neighbor, the thing is, after k, you have a hard cutoff. You don't care about what happens outside your viewpoint. Right? After. Uh, so, uh, so, so what she's asking about, what Artie is asking about, is kernel classifiers, where you know you have something like this, right? Um, uh, your predictor is sum over uh, x i e to the minus uh, x minus x i squared divided by you know c, c squared, right? But there, the thing is, your uh, you still depend on your entire training set, right? So you still depend on the rest of the space. And the dependence grows weaker and weaker as, you know, so, so normally you would, uh, you know, this would be a C of N and you would normally expect this to go to zero, but you never completely cut off. So, but what if you just use a box car kernel? I guess I'm just talking about fixed bandwidth. Yeah, uh, I see. Yeah, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, we haven't, we haven't looked at that. We haven't looked at that? It's, uh, uh, all I'll tell you is that it's not as clean, so we haven't looked at it. Um. Good question. Yes. Um. Okay. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Um.